Welcome to today's program titled 2020 Cal Peculiarities, How California Employment Law is Different. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLA credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLA attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLA credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn this uh, over to Kobe. Kobe, you may begin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our annual Cal Peculiarities webinar. Um, for those of you that have attended in the past, thank you, and I, um, also welcome to the new attendees who are here for the first time. Um, presenting will be um, my colleagues Chantel Egan from our San Francisco office, myself in Sacramento, and Anne-Marie Zalatel in our Los Angeles office. Um, just a quick disclaimer, um, as most of you know, this is not legal advice, this is just for information only, so if you have any specific questions um, that you need for your own business and you'd like to have discussions with us about that offline, please do, don't hesitate to contact us. Oh, and here is uh, the contact information for myself, Chantelle, and Anne-Marie. If you have any questions, you can submit them both in the chat box or you can email us offline. Uh, at this point, I'd like to give a little plug to our Cal Peculiarities blog. I am partial to it as a senior editor of the blog. I've been working on the blog for, oh gosh, probably almost 10 years now. And it is uh, where I go to myself for many of my resources, but I also like to plug it for our clients because we answer a lot of questions that employers have on there. We try to make it pithy and funny as well, so hopefully it's not too dense for you. But just so you know, many of the things that we post as blog entries actually come from regular counseling questions that we get from our clients. So there are issues that are coming up in the California landscape that many employers have questions on. And keeping track of the blog will help you not only keep track of recent legal updates in California, but also potential liability or counseling questions that are affecting businesses throughout the state. Um, next, we have our agenda. We've got a short list of the topics we're going to be covering here today, just so you've got an index here. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Anne-Marie, or I'm sorry, to Chantel, who's going to discuss some sick pay issues with respect to the COVID-19. Hello, and welcome all to the webinar. Um, there has been a onslaught of um, paid sick issues that have arisen as part of the state and local jurisdictions response to, um, to COVID-19 throughout California. Um, the, uh, as you can see the list on your screen, there's been quite a few. Um, and big picture, what these um, ordinances and orders are designed to do is to address the gap by the Families First um, Federal Act, which is focused on employers of under uh, with less than 500 employees. So the general matter, that's what these particular ordinances are designed to make sure that uh, larger employees that are operating in these particular locations are also providing COVID-related um, time off, um, as well as um, in, in some areas such as San Jose for the for the smaller set, which is the under 50. Um, uh, throughout the state, uh, Governor Newsom, who is our, our governor here in California, uh, issued an order regarding the food sector. So uh, those are employees that are um, involved in uh, pushing out our, our food products here in, in California, that they are provided additional um, 80 hours worth of time in order to uh, uh, either because they've been subject to isolation or quarantine or they otherwise need um, uh, care for a minor child um, and, and other services related to COVID-19. Now, in the localities, 
um, we're seeing some differences between each of these. And, you know, I won't go into to all of the nuances today, but the, the most important thing, and if I could give you any advice in trying to manage COVID-19 um, issues, and frankly, just having employees in California, is that you're really going to want to make sure that you're not just complying with the state rules, but you're looking to your local jurisdictions to ensure that you are complying with any local laws. And we're really seeing an uptick in that um, in response to COVID-19. Um, so uh, for, for the uh, local ordinances, what we're looking at is um, 80 hours of additional time um, that an employee can take off Typically, because they're subject to quarantine or isolation, they've been advised by a healthcare provider to do the same, where they're caring for somebody. Um, they are having uh, symptoms related to COVID-19, and they're seeking a medical diagnosis. Or likewise, they're caring for, uh, in most jurisdictions, it's because they're either caring for a child or they're also caring for um, an adult who has um, lost their typical care, for example, daycare or school, um, due to COVID-19 and they're unable to secure an alternate uh, caregiver. Um, there are some really notable exceptions. Um, so for example, in, um, in places like Long Beach and San Francisco, there is an offset, but only if um, the uh, employer had provided additional time in response to COVID-19. So if an employer, for example, had provided 40 extra hours um, for people to manage uh, absences due to COVID-19, then that can be used as an offset for those particular ordinances. Um, in places like San Jose, there is also an offset, but that offset is measured by collectively the, the available time off that an employee had. So for example, if an employee had um, uh, 80 hours of personal time, including you know, uh, sick time through the through the state paid sick um, as of uh, a particular date in March, then, um, then there would be no need to give them additional time. Um, and uh, the other kind of big flag issue is in the city of Oakland. Um, Oakland has something that is unique to all of these ordinances, um, and that has a provision that if an employee is laid off uh, through the time that this particular ordinance is in effect, which is through the end of the year, then um, uh, that employee will have to be paid out all their accrued sick time that they've accrued through the local ordinance, it's Prop FF um, in Oakland, that they have accrued, um, which is very, um, which is very new because typically we don't see um, any kind of payout of sick time um, at termination. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Anne Marie. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chantel, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, I guess depending on your time zone. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about uh, COVID-19 return to work issues. Um, we recognize that the webinar today is about Cal peculiarities, but just given the current pandemic, um, we felt we would be remiss if we didn't spend just um, a little time talking about COVID-19. Um, in addition to the um, additional sick leave um, laws and ordinances that Chantel has mentioned, there are just a host of issues that um, employers are considering now as they contemplate um, returning uh, to business, uh, returning to the workplace in some um, in some form. And um, here at CIFARS, we have formed a um, COVID-19, uh, it's a multidisciplinary task force, um, meaning it includes not just labor and employment attorneys, but also attorneys who specialize in employee benefits, corporate, real estate, and tax. And um, all three of us are, are members of the task force, um, along with about uh, uh, another uh, 100 lawyers or so around, uh, around the globe and across our offices. And um, the task force also includes a recovery and renewal team that is focused specifically on return to work issues. 
to really help clients build phased return to work plans by modeling various scenarios for how businesses might resume, um, you know, from continued uh, social distancing to uh, hopefully down the road, uh, full engagement of their workforce and in full operations. Um, and on your slide here, there are an, a, just a, a few of the, the numerous um, return to work issues um, to be considered. Um, we do have a complimentary 30-page um, return to business checklist that is um, available on our website. Uh, the link is right here on uh, the slide or, or the, the address. Um, I would uh, urge you to, to check that out um, as it um, should provide you with a lot of assistance as you uh, develop your return to work plans. And with that, I am going to turn it back to uh, Kobe. Okay, now to take us away from COVID for a minute, given that probably most of you have been living in this world consistently for the last few months, I'm going to take you into another favorite subject of employers and companies in California, which is the state of independent contractors and the ABC test. So for those of you that don't remember this all sort of came about a couple of years ago now with respect to a lawsuit called Dynamics. It had to do with some truck drivers and whether or not they were considered independent contractors or employees. Um, what happened in that lawsuit, for those of you that don't remember, is that the court basically adopted a new test for employment at the time um, that had been in a number of other states but was new to California, and it is called uh, colloquially the ABC test. So the employer has to prove the worker is free from direction and control, that the worker performs work that's outside of the hiring entity's business, and that the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, et cetera. Now, you guys may be well familiar with this now. However, um, what we're starting to see is a lot more enforcement because where companies are found to have misclassified people, there are pretty staunch potential penalties that range from about $5,000 for willful mass classifications to up to $25,000 for patterns and practices of violations. Employers can also be found liable for back wages, penalties, and fines, and they can be assessed state and federal back payroll taxes with penalties. Um, we've also been dealing with some litigation related to potential liability for benefits issues where employees were misclassified and not receiving the kinds of benefits that employees at the company were otherwise receiving. Uh, so those are the kinds of litigation, the main kinds of litigation we've been seeing come out of this since uh, the ABC test was established. Now, the ABC test, when it came out, just had to do with claims that arose under the wage orders. But the state of California, um, as it is wont to do, uh, made that even tougher for businesses in the state of California, and they enacted what is known as AB5, which amended or added Section 2750. Point three of the labor code. That became effective January 1st of this year. And that expanded the dynamics case to make the ABC test the default for all labor code, unemployment insurance code, and wage order claims. So now that means that what was only wage order claims before covers a bunch of additional causes of action to which it did not previously apply, such as uh, claims for failure to reimburse necessary business expenses, to failure to provide accurate wage statements. Um, thus, this bill is impacting businesses and industries across the board. Um, and the bill also empowered the state attorney general and certain city attorneys to pursue injunctions against businesses suspected of misclassifying independent contractors. There are a number of exemptions that were uh, that were enacted when AB5 first came down. Um, those are known as the business-to-business -business exemptions, so, such as where um, your company may contract with another company that, for example, cleans your uh, offices at night, um, or where they are certain service, types of service providers. Uh, those tend to be professional services such as marketing, HR contractors, graphic designers, that sort of thing. And there is also, um, and those are professional services as well. And then there are, have been a number of other categories uh, that were carved into the bill originally for 
example, medical professionals, attorneys, architects, et cetera, all of those were carved out of AB5 from the inception. Now, um, since this bill passed, it has basically been a big mess for those of you that have been following it in the news. Um, there has been one set of cleanup legislation introduced after another. The most recent large omnibus clean, cleanup legislation is known as AB 1850, um, and it basically has a bunch more exemptions that it is carving into the law. Uh, for example, like youth sports coaches, real estate appraisers, things like that. So it um, is both things that you don't traditionally think of as a job, like a youth sports coach, um, as well as sort of more high wage jobs. And 1850 keeps low income employees that might otherwise be independent contractors under the umbrella of AB5. And that would typically be people that are involved in gig type jobs. Um, with respect to the enforcement of AB5, California as a state has taken it very seriously and Governor Newsom has allocated more than 20 million in his budget this year to enforce the law. Um, and some of you may be following the newer uh, litigation brought by Attorney General Becerra against um, some of the ride-sharing companies um, alleging that they've misclassified their drivers in violation of AB, AB5. So that is the first big sort of splashy litigation that we've seen in terms of the enforcement by the state. Um, as I mentioned, there has been, in addition to 1850, there has now been 35 bills introduced into the state legislature to make changes to AB5. And as many of you may be thinking, like if you need 35 exceptions to a law, uh, it probably should not be a law in the first place. So we are, <laughs> that is a common refrain. Um, and every single one of them is being introduced to exempt certain additional new categories of workers. Um, so far, none of them have passed. Um, they've all generally been introduced by industry groups with the exception of AB 1850, which was introduced by the author of the bill herself. So that one, uh, and that's Lorena Gonzalez. So that one actually looks like it has a decent chance of passing. Um, to date, there have been some limited successes and attacks on the new law about the um, independent contractor classification. One of the biggest of which was brought by independent truckers. So um, there's an association here of independent truckers called the California Trucking Association. And in November, they, by the way, they represent about 70,000 truck drivers in the state. So in November of last year, they filed a lawsuit here in the Southern District of California challenging AB5 and the dynamics ruling and argued that um, they were essentially being unconstitutionally stripped of their livelihoods um, by enforcement of AB5. The association has actually won a TRO, a temporary restraining order, against enforcement of AB5 as to the motor carriers, uh, arguing that they are exempt under the uh, under under federal law from AB5. Currently, uh, that lawsuit is pending with the Ninth Circuit on appeal filed by California's very own Attorney General Becerra, as well as the Teamsters Union, who are staunchly challenging it because, as you might imagine, they uh, do not want independent uh, truckers to be able to work as independent contractors. There has also been some success with freelancer creative professionals, such as uh, musicians, writers, and artists, who have been staunchly lob lobbying Attorney Gen um, not Att Assemblywoman Gonzalez, and they have been lobbying to get exceptions for themselves as well. And so they have introduced a bill that has actually garnered a pretty decent amount of support, both by industry professionals and people in the Congress. Um, and essentially, this creative professionals would cover uh, people like uh, there was a, a cap, for example, on freelance writers being able to submit 35 submissions for uh, writing and still be an independent contractor. So that cap would be eliminated. Also, it allows a number of people involved in the composition of music, such as music engineers, singers, artists, um, and um, sound mixers, that sort of thing. Um, and it also allows for other types of creative artists to be exempt from AB5. Um, if that passes, which it looks like it might, um, it is going to be introduced as an urgency measure, so it could go into effect and give a carve-out as early 
as mid or late summer, and it would have retroactive application. So potentially, um, even if these people were allegedly misclassified during the period in which there was not an exemption, it would provide retroactive protection for those people. Um, for those of you that have been following the Instacart litigation, um, it was down here in San Diego, California, and at first it was um, the court ruled against Instacart and had issued a temporary restraining order, uh, basically commanding them to reclassify their drivers as employees down in San Diego. But Instacart was able to gather a stay of the litigation while it appeals. So they uh, had the plus of getting a stay, and we're, we are following that litigation closely as well. And last but not least, um, this actually happened very recently in the news that uh, there has been a ballot measure that has garnered enough signatures from citizens here in the state of California that would um, protect essentially gig workers um, and, and it would allow them to maintain independent contractor status. This has been largely sponsored by some of the major gig companies here in California, but now it's going to the ballot for California voters to decide. And there are some provisions to this, um, the ballot measure, including that there would be an earnings floor of 120% of minimum wage and some expense reimbursement and other types of benefits that would be available to these kinds of workers if the ballot measure passes. Um, but that will be pending here in November. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to my colleague, Anne-Marie, to talk about some new bans in the state of California. Thanks very much, Kobe. So we have uh, two new bans uh, in 2020. Uh, the first is a ban on no rehire provisions in settlement agreements. And this is a uh, dramatic change um, in, in practice. So as I'm sure um, most of you um, uh, know, uh, settlement agreements resolving employment-related claims uh, traditionally and typically have included a no rehire provision in which the former employee um, promises that um, he or she will not seek employment um, with the employer or its affiliates in the future. Um, and, and that promise um, gives the employer an independent basis to reject uh, the settling uh, employer, former employees, um, subsequent employment application. And employers traditionally um, have um, very much um, favored these provisions because um, when an employee or former employee releases claims, they're not releasing claims that may arise in the future. They only are releasing claims that have accrued up to the date they signed the agreement. And it's impossible to, um, to get a release of future claims that would not be valid or enforceable. So employers understandably like to have the peace of mind that once this dispute is resolved, they you know, will, not, um, uh, will not be crossing paths with the, the settling individual, um, the individual, individual whose claims they're resolving through um, through the settlement and, and through the, the monetary payment. Um, unfortunately, as of January of this year, uh, California Assembly Bill 749, which was signed by the governor, and it's actually codified in the Code of Civil Procedure. If you want this section, it's um, section 1002.5. And um, essentially what it provides is that employers may no longer require current or former employees with whom they are resolving employment-related claims to agree not to seek employment in the future with the employer. Um, the, the bill supporters argued that no rehire provisions um, discouraged reports of workplace discrimination and harassment, meaning you know someone isn't going to come forward because if they settle their claim, they're going to be forced to resign and agree not to seek reemployment um, with the with their employer. Um, there are three narrow exceptions um, to the, the new law. Um, the first is that um, employers and current employees can enter into severance agreements to end current relationships and include 
no rehire provisions in those severance agreements. Um, a severance agreement is different from a settlement agreement under which you're resolving specific claims that have been alleged. Um, no rehire provisions are also permissible in settlement agreements where the employer has found in good faith that the person signing the agreement engaged in sexual harassment or sexual assault. And then finally, the, uh, the new law does not require employment or rehire um, if the employer has a legitimate non-discriminatory and non-retaliatory reason, reason to deny employment. Um, so even without the no rehire provision in your settlement, settlement agreement, you don't have to rehire, but um, unlike, um, unlike with the provision, uh, your decision not to rehire and to deny reemployment um, is going to potentially be subject to a failure to hire claim where you'll have to defend your reason um, as legitimate and non discriminatory. So the second ban is, is uh, and it's I'm sure you, you all are aware of, um, of this development. It's pretty significant. Uh, I think I spent, uh, when this um, uh, legislation, AB 51, uh, passed before it became effective, I think I spent the, the last couple months of, of the year uh, about 70% of my practice advising employers on what to do about their mandatory arbitration uh, agreement programs because um, AB 51 kind of, um, you know, in line with California's um, sort of traditional hostility towards mandatory arbitration agreements, um, California AB 51, which was effective in January, makes it unlawful to impose arbitration agreements as a condition of employment. Um, the law was quickly challenged as being preempted by the Federal Arbitration Act, um, and uh, the law has been preliminarily enjoined um, by a district court judge in the Eastern District of California, Judge Muller. Um, and the lawsuit was brought by uh, the California Chamber of Commerce and other groups um, arguing that the law is um, invalid and unlawful because it's preempted by the Federal Arbitration Act um, in that it discriminates against arbitration and interferes with the FAA's objectives, not only with respect to the enforceability of arbitration agreements, but as to their creation. Um, also, um, this year, the California Supreme Court um, on a separate note, held that an arbitration agreement was unconscionable because it failed to provide a process sufficiently affordable and accessible to require employees to forego an administrative Berman wage hearing. So the, the agreement, which was um, in a small font, it was an 8.5 uh, font, and it was... Um, lengthy uh, and contained kind of uh, opaque sentences, the court found, was um, presented to the plaintiff without time for him to review before signing. And um, although the court found the agreement might be adequate for wrongful termination claims, it was substantively unconscionable for wage claims um, because its litigation-like procedures were unduly complex and lengthy. Um, in contrast to um, the, the simpler Berman hearing. Um, so in terms of these, um, these bans and, and what you should do in response to them if you haven't done so already. Um, so first, with respect to um, arbitration agreements, um, as of now, it, the AB 51 is enjoined. Um, the judge found it, um, it is most likely preempted by the, the Federal Arbitration Act, but that decision is, is not final. Um, uh, so 
during the pendency of the litigation, employers have a couple of choices. Um, you know, those who are most confident have decided that um, they will stay the course with their mandatory arbitration uh, agreements um, that require employees to sign the agreement as a condition of employment um, in the belief that AB 51 is indeed um, preempted by the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, more cautious employers, a number of them have suspended their mandatory arbitration programs um, until the litigation is um, is resolved. Um, it, you know, some have um, suspended them altogether, whereas um, others have made their arbitration agreements um, voluntary and not a condition of employment. Um, in that regard, it's important to note, though, that the law prohibits um, opt-out provisions. Uh, so it would need to be, um, if you were um, taking the more conservative approach by voluntary agreement, they mean an agreement um, where the employee um, voluntarily signs it or opts in as opposed to opting out. Um, arbitration under AB 51 cannot be the default. Um, also, it's important um, with respect to the new um, ban on no rehire provisions, it's really important to review and, as necessary, revise your form settlement agreements to um, delete this, uh, the no rehire provision um, that, um, that very well may be included in your agreement. Many of our clients are opting to create California-specific settlement template agreements to address this change so that they can continue using no rehire provisions in, in other jurisdictions in which they operate. With that, I am going to discuss um, minimum wage uh, law development. Um, so first of all, um, as um, what will probably be a review for um, a lot of you. I know we've covered um, the California uh, Fair Wage Act of, of 2016 uh, for the past uh, for the past four years. But um, as a reminder, um, the um, Fair Wage Act, the California Minimum Wage Law, the Fair Wage Act of 2016. Um, effectively increases the minimum wage to $15 per hour by January 1st of 2022 for employers with 26 or more employees and by January 1st, 2023 for smaller employers, meaning those with 25 or fewer employees. So each year the minimum wage um, increases by a certain amount um, until it reaches the $15 um, amount in 2022 and 2023. So as of January this year, uh, as of January 1st, the minimum wage for larger employers, meaning those with 26 or more employees, increased um, from $12 to $13 an hour. Um, it's important to remember this is often overlooked because the California um, white collar uh, overtime exemptions, the administrative, executive, and professional employee exemptions are tied to the California state minimum wage. The minimum salary raises each time the minimum wage goes up. Um, so with the increase to $13 an hour for the larger employers, the minimum salary threshold increased in January from $49,920 to $54,080. And for smaller employers, again, those with 25 or fewer employees, um, the minimum wage um, increased from $11 to $12 an hour. And as a result, the minimum annual salary threshold for the executive, administrative, and professional employees increased from $45,760 to 49,920. Um, also after we've started to receive questions about what happens after January 1st, uh, 2023. And beginning the first January 1st, after the minimum wage increases to 
$15 an hour, um, again, which will be January 1st of 2024. It'll increase on January 1st of 2023. But then the following uh, January, the minimum wage will be indexed annually for inflation. Um, one interesting um, possibility is the governor can pause wage hikes based on economic conditions. And so the, um, the law, the Fair Wage Act of 2016, requires the California Director of Finance to annually determine whether economic conditions can support the scheduled minimum wage increase and um, the director of finance has to certify that determination to Governor Newsom and to the California legislature. Um, and Governor Newsom then can suspend the scheduled increases um, a maximum of two times. So thus far, he has not done so, but um, it's interesting um, to, to think that, um, you know, there may be a possibility this year with the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the um, the uh, you know large unemployment um, rate, uh, Governor Newsom could decide to to suspend uh, the scheduled increase in January 1st, um, 2021. Um, also on this slide, this is just a reminder that um, the federal minimum wage is is 7.25 an hour. It hasn't changed since 2009, um, except with respect to um, workers on federal construction and service contracts. Um, President Obama signed Executive Order 13658 back in 2014, and under that order, the minimum wage for these workers increased to $10.10 per hour. It's really important not to overlook the fact that um, numerous um, California cities and other localities have enacted their own uh, minimum wage laws that um, impose a minimum wage that is higher than the California statewide minimum wage. On your slide here, um, we've included just a few of, of the examples um, and uh, What's important to note here is um, that you want to make sure that employees who maybe work temporarily, maybe they work for you in one location, but um, they're working for you temporarily in another city, they've transferred to another location. The, um, in my experience, um, employers often overlook that that particular city, um, even if it's close by, very well may have a different minimum wage that is higher than, um, than the employee's former location and they neglect to, um, to adjust the employee's wage to reflect the, the new minimum wage in, in the jurisdiction that the employee is working. So it's important to keep in mind that um, even if the employee is only temporarily working at, in, in that um, other location with the higher minimum wage, he or she is entitled to the higher minimum wage during the time um, during the time he or she is working in that location. So, in terms of some action items for you, um, you know, first, um, as minimum wage rates increase. Um, Make sure that you uh, make the necessary adjustments for all non-exempt employees in the affected jurisdictions. And um, as I just mentioned, uh, keep in mind um, that um, as you have workers uh, changing locations, you'll need to check um, what the minimum wage is in, in their new location. Also make sure that the required posters are being displayed in your break rooms, lunch rooms, or other conspicuous location in the workplace. And then finally, make sure that you um, ensure that your exempt employees who are exempt under the um, white collar exemptions are receiving um, at least the annual salary of $54,080 um, for em employers with 26 or more employees 
and um, the slightly lesser salary I mentioned for the smaller employers with 25 or fewer employees. So lactation accommodation requirements um, expansion. So California has had a lactation accommodation statute on the book since 2002. So, so the concept is not new, but um, in this past year, the statute was significantly amended um, to um, provide additional um, obligations on the part of employers. So um, as of January 1st of this year, the obligations are, are much broader. Um, the um, amended statute, um, which uh, in case you're curious, is found in the Labor Code at sections 1030 to 1034. It requires employers to provide lactation locations, that's a mouthful, um, that meet certain specific requirements that are listed here on the slide. The location can't be a bathroom. Um, second, it has to be in close proximity to the employee's work area. Um, also shielded from view and free from intrusion during lactation. Um, also, it has to provide a clean, safe, and free um, it has to be the, the room safe, clean, and free of hazardous materials. It has to contain a surface to place a breast pump and personal items, a place to sit, and um, must have access to needed electricity or alternative devices such as extension cords or charging stations. Um, employers also must provide access to a sink with running water and a refrigerator suitable for storing breast milk. Um, a multi-purpose room still can be used, but lactation takes precedence over other uses. Um, so that is um, important to keep in mind. Um, the new law does include an undue hardship exemption for employers with fewer than 50 employees. Um, an employer that employs fewer than 50 employees may be exempt from one or more requirements um, in the section if the employer has to be able to demonstrate that the requirement would impose an undue hardship by causing the employer significant difficulty or expense, um, and that is considered in relation to the employer's size, financial resources, um, nature of the employer's business, as well as the structure of the employer's business. Um, and then, uh, even if the employer can demonstrate that the particular requirement would impose um, an undue hardship, the employer still has to make reasonable efforts to provide the employee with use of a room or other location other than a toilet stall in close proximity to the employee's work area um, for lactation purposes. So it doesn't mean that you are free, completely free of the obligation. It just means if you can demonstrate undue hardship, um, the room you provide doesn't have to meet um, all of the requirements listed um, in the slide. Um, also, before I, I discuss the next slide, I just um, want to uh, tie this development to, to COVID-19 and the fact that in my practice right now, I am advising employers on establishing social distancing measures, um, you know, in preparation for the return to the, to the workplace. And um, a lot of them, in order to have the requisite um, six feet distance, um, are needing to repurpose some of their common uh, conference rooms or other common areas for employee uh, cubicles or temporary offices. And so if you are engaging in those efforts, you just want to be mindful of your lactation accommodation obligations and make sure that you um, save a multi-purpose room for this purpose. Um, and so next on this slide, um, one of the additional new features of the law is that there's now an express written policy requirement. Um, and not only is there a requirement that 
California employers now have lactation accommodation policies, there is a very detailed um, content requirement. So the policy must include um, all of the information that is listed uh, on, on this slide. Um, so this is um, a fairly, uh, um, this comes as a shock, I think, to, to a lot of employers, um, the fact that they now have to um, include information about uh, filing a claim with the labor commissioner um, for uh, violation of, of the lactation accommodation uh, obligation. So in terms of the penalties for, for violations, um, first of all, the um, denial of the either the break time. So there are two requirements, right, under the law, two kind of separate requirements. The first is uh, break time for the lactation. Uh, the second is the adequate space. Um, uh, in accordance with um, the requirements that discussed a couple of slides ago. Um, and so violation of either of these provisions is um, deemed a failure to comply with California Labor Code 226.7, which means that um, an aggrieved employee may file a complaint with the labor code, um, I'm sorry, with the labor commissioner pursuant to section 98 of the labor code. Um, also, an employer shall not discharge or in any manner discriminate or retaliate against an employee for either exercising her lactation uh, rights or attempting to do so. Um, and an employee may report a violation to the labor commissioner's field office upon which the labor commissioner um, will investigate the claim. And um, if the labor commissioner uh, determines that there's been a violation, uh, he or she may um, issue a citation and may impose a civil penalty of $100 for each day that the employee is denied either the break um, or the, um, the adequate space um, for lactation purposes. So um, in terms of action items, there are a number of action items that you, you want to take as soon as possible if you haven't done so already. Um, the first is to develop um, a lactation accommodation policy, or if you have one, to modify it so that it complies with the content requirements um, that I just reviewed. Um, also, um, you will need to, uh, the law requires that the policy, the lactation accommodation policy be included in your handbook or and if you don't have a handbook, some other set of policies that you distribute and make available to employees. And additionally, um, under the law, you're required to distribute the policy to all new hires and to any employee um, who inquires about uh, parental leave. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my partner, Chantel. Chantel? Hi, sorry, my apologies. Um, <laughs> I was talking, talking into my mute button. So, um, <laughs> the, the, the glories of technology. Um, yes. So, what, what I'm going to be speaking about is the paid family leave expansion. So, going back to this slide. Um, so in July, the um, paid family leave benefit will be extended to eight weeks from the current six weeks. As a reminder, paid family leave is um, uh, focused on um, uh, you know, spending time for, for bonding with your child as well as um, to care for um, a, a sick family member. Um, and so now this, this particular amount of time is going to be increased to eight weeks. Um, 
Now, what is interesting is that a task force um, has been um, put together, and the focus of that is to further extend paid family leave um, to as much as uh, six months um, by 2021, 2022. Um, but the focus of that expansion is focused, focused exclusively on um, baby bonding um, and whether that is because you've adopted a, a child or you've become a foster parent or as well as you have a, a child by natural birth. And while that outside limit is six months, um, the intent is actually that no employee would take more than three months so that it's a total for each parent. Um, of three months each, uh, assuming that it's a two-parent household. Um, additionally, there is a push to increase the funding, providing as much as 90% of the wage replacement for lower wage earners. We already have a, a sliding scale depending on um, how much income a employee earns. Um, and the, the thing that people really have to be mindful of is the interplay of paid family leave with local ordinances. In particular, places like San Francisco that have a, um, uh, it's called a, uh, it's a parental leave ordinance that's focused on time taken for baby bonding, and it is designed to, to fill that gap up to a cap. So if an employee is receiving, let's say, 70%, of their wages through the um, paid family leave through the EDD, the employer would uh, supplement up to 30% subject to a cap so that the employee could, for purposes of bonding with their child, take that full time. Um, and the uh, San Francisco has already made abundantly clear that um, this amount will be increased to eight weeks um, as of July 1. Um, and uh, as this, uh, Benefit is expanded, focused primarily on baby bonding. That's certainly something to keep um, be mindful of. The OLSC, which is the enforcement agency for the San Francisco Parental Leave, is a very active agency, um, and compliance with that ordinance is uh, certainly to be expected. There was actually quite a few um, uh, FIA updates as well this year. Um, the big news is that the um, statute of limitations for um, filing a complaint with the DFEH has now been ex expanded to three years. Previously, it was just one year. So, for example, if an employee um, claims that they were terminated um, due to discrimination based on a protected class, within one year of that termination date, they had to file um, their DFEH claim, which is a requirement before pursuing litigation um, in the court system. You have to exhaust your administrative claims. So that date is incredibly important because it's a gatekeeper to, um, to litigation. Um, now with this amendment, um, a complainant has three years to bring that claim. Um, so if an, empo an employee is terminated allegedly due to discrimination, they have three years in order to bring that claim, which is quite a bit of time um, and certainly something that um, employers need to be mindful about in terms of um, making sure that they have adequate record keeping and um, that they have proper records um, memorializing why employees were terminated and such because litigation may be or even or an investigation by the DFEH may be quite some time after an event has occurred. Um, importantly, the law does not revive claims that have already lapsed as of January 1. So um, if an employee has, uh, or a former employee has um, a grievance and they've missed their, their one year limitation, it doesn't now get extended. Um, additionally, FIHA um, also clarified that we've, that race includes traits that are historically associated with race, and in particular, focusing on hair texture um, and hairstyles. So, for example, if um, someone from the African American community has a afro or has a braids or certain type of hairstyle that is um, could be um, connected with their race, that that is now protected. So, braids, locks, twists, things of that nature. Um, if this is going to be incredibly important as we as we think about um, 
employees in the workplace and how this is going to impact uniforms and things of that nature. Additionally, uh, further a donation leave has been provided for organ and bone marrow uh, donors. Uh, previously, uh, for these types of activities, um, an employee was already provided uh, 30 days of paid leave um, and, and a little bit of uh, lesser time for bone marrow donors, but now we have additional unpaid leave of absence for um, those activities. So making sure that you're complying. Um, it's very important, as I hinted to earlier, that we need to be mindful about uh, DFEH investigations and litigation now may be happening much later than we um, had you know than we had previously planned for with the one year um, prior limitation, so we want to make sure that we are retaining our personnel files for at least three years, if not more, um, and that is especially um, important um, as as employers think about defending these claims. And it's really not just their personnel file retention program; it's really any other um, uh, document retention system. For example, if um, if you are maintaining records about why a particular layoff occurred, for example, making sure that you have adequate records so that if you have to go back and revisit those facts, you can do so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we want to ensure that any kind of dress code isn't going to be um, pinpointing any particular ethnicity, but of course, focusing on a particular hairstyle. Where we really see this is in the context of a uniform. For example, if a uniform requires a particular hat, We've had to um, address this from the vantage point of religion previously. Now we need to think about it in terms of, um, of hairstyles and whether any adjustments need to be made um, in order to uh, comply with the amendments to the law. And of course, you know, as you should do every year, you know, review your um, handbook to ensure that any updates are being made. And in, of course, we're going to want to address the bone marrow and organ donation leave policies in your handbook. There was also a big change in the law regarding the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. And you may know this as when you go to a website now, uh, you get that little disclaimer that says, you know, we're capturing cookies and, you know, do you approve monitoring this? This is really where we're seeing the California Consumer Privacy Act um, kind of play itself out in, uh, in our daily lives. But it does also impact um, employees. Now, as a general matter, um, employees are not considered consumers under under this new act. So many of the requirements under the act, um, employ, uh, compliance is, is not a primary issue for employers. However, privacy notices must be provided in particular policies. And in that policy, it needs to clearly spell out what categories of personal information is going to be collected and for what purpose? Um, and uh, additionally, it makes sense that if um, you are collecting that information, that you're also um, informing employees the technology that you're going to be using to collect that information, as well as any third parties that are going to have access to that personal data. Um, and to the extent that third parties have access, you know, for what purpose, whether it's just to house the data, um, for many employers, you're not housing your own data, you are instead, um, uh, you know, using a third party vendor for that, or whether it is for purposes of, um, you know, running metrics or um, providing services to the employer, uh, that should certainly be disclosed to the, um, to the employee. Now, the regulations include some, some draft, the draft regulations, I should emphasize, uh, include some general principles um, to ensure that a policy is not unfair or deceptive. And the key with this is you want to use plain and straightforward language. The easiest way of saying that is you don't want to couch it in a bunch of legalese. You want to make sure that your policy, not just this policy, but really any policy, can be easily understood. You also want to have something that it is it draws the um, the format it draws the employee's attention. So it's not going to be buried in um, some larger policy. You want to make sure that it is um, properly highlighted so that it will catch your employee's attention. Likewise, the policy should be in all the languages that are typically used by your employees. So, for example, if you have an employee population that 
speaks predominantly Spanish, um, you're going to want to ensure that your this policy as well as all of your policies are in Spanish. And not surprisingly, also ensuring that individuals with disabilities also have ability to uh, review and access this policy. Now, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, if we had been talking about this back in January, um, we, uh, we wouldn't be talking about COVID. But now the act has really taken on some new meaning in light of COVID-19, especially with the um, collection of data regarding employees' symptoms and other personal information to, uh, to take steps to ensure that we are minimizing the transmission of COVID-19. Um, with that in mind, uh, many thought that the uh, California Attorney General that can begin enforcement on January 1 of, rather, I'm sorry, July 1 of this year may actually, you know, take the foot off the gas and give um, employers some more time. Um, but however, uh, the Attorney General has um, uh, made it very clear that the enforcement will not be pushed out and in, um, has issued a statement saying, we're all mindful of the new reality created by COVID-19 and the heightened value of protecting consumers' privacy online that comes with it. We encourage businesses to be particularly mindful of data security in this time of emergency. Now, um, obviously it seems from that quote that the focus is, is back to that cookie example I was giving earlier with websites, but it's certainly something that employers need to be mindful about um, because the scope of personal information that is now being uh, collected may have expanded due to COVID-19. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about harassment training. Um, many of you um, are probably already aware that there was some big changes to the harassment training requirements. Um, and many of us were you know, running around with our uh, hair on fire trying to make sure that uh, in employees were trained. The big news is that um, the the state instead of having a, a 50 employee threshold had a five person five employee threshold uh, requiring training and now training is not just for supervisors but also for all employees and the deadline to comply with non-supervisory employee training which is a new element to this law it was extended originally it was supposed to be completed by january 1 2020 um, hence as i mentioned earlier there was quite a bit of frantic activity before this extension um, and um, but with um, the extension now em employers have till the end of the year um, there's also been clarification that supervisors that received their training back in 2018 can wait until this year, 2020, to be trained. There was some confusion at first about whether it was required that they, um, under the new law, had to have actually, a, instead of an every two-year training, having a, um, a training last year in order to, in essence, catch up, if you will, under the new law. Um, now, with their new hire, though, it is incredibly important that within six months of starting a new supervisory position, that they need to provide harassment training within that first six months. And where you really need to make sure that you are flagging this is not just for your new hires, but for individuals that have been promoted into roles that they now have supervisory capacity. Um, because that is where one of the places that we're seeing, um, in essence, a, a pitfall in terms of employers uh, realizing that they, that they must comply. There's also some special industry requirements. Um, in particular, seasonal and temporary employees um, that are only working for a company for less than six months, they also must receive mandatory sex, uh, sexual harassment training. Um, that requirement goes into effect uh, January 1. That training for those temporary employees should occur within the first 30 days of their employment um, for, you know, uh, for um, employers such as, you know, retail that are hiring um, for the holiday season and, and things of that nature, it's certainly something to be mindful of, especially if um, you're hiring for the holiday season but keeping employees on through the end of January um, for the expectation that there will be returns and things of that nature, you're going to fall under this, under this statute. Um, 
And um, additionally, there's construction has special training requirements, and there's also special um, requirements for janitorial workers. And in particular, with janitorial workers, um, their training um, it's their training needs to be in person and interactive. Now, for the other individuals, the, the regulations that have come out provide a myriad of ways for an employer to deliver harassment training. While it must be interactive and be presented by a qualified trainer, um, uh, e-learning, classroom learning, webinars, things of that nature are permitted as long as um, the the program you can ensure that the employees are interact are interacting with the program. I'm sure that some of you listening today have you know done an, an online service uh, requiring um, uh, you know you, you click through if you will to show that you are participating and answering questions. So the DLSC's proposed regulations regarding janitorial training on the other hand as I mentioned require in-person interactive training and expressly forbids webinars and e-learning. Um, now, there has not been clarity on how that's now going to impact um, in light of COVID-19. Um, I would not be surprised if there is some, um, uh, I would say, some uh, flexibility <laughs> regarding uh, complying in that way. Uh, simply, for example, the in-person training now perhaps is in-person but virtually, so through video conferencing and things of that nature. But there's been no specific guidance about um, how to uh, how to comply. Additionally, janitorial employees have to do two hours of training, and that's a departure from the non-supervisory employees that only have to do an hour of training. Typically, only the supervisors have two hours of training, um, and and the non-supervisory employees have an hour. Um, additionally. Uh, resources for sexual violence and harassment need to be provided during the training, and in particular, uh, uh, crisis rape centers should be identified so that employees that are janitor that are from the janitorial service can have access to those community resources. Um, the training should be provided in the attendee's language, and really that goes across the board. Now, all training there needs, there definitely should be a written record of the completed training. Um, and uh, an employer should be prepared to provide that training uh, materials as well as to prove that an employee has uh, timely taken that training. Um, this is important not only to comply with any agency requests, but also with a um, uh, any defensive litigation uh, to demonstrate that the employer has taken steps to prevent harassment. Um, now, before I move on to our next slide. Um, I'm going to provide a CLE code. The code is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 5517. Once again, that's SS5517. Um, and you will receive instructions on how to submit that code um, for credit for, for CLA credit for this um, webinar. And so with that, I will pass this over to uh, Kobe. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to those of you that reminded us to do the CLE code, because sometimes when you get rolling, you have it sitting in front of you and still forget to say it out loud. So I appreciate the little reminders in the chat boxes. Um, so moving on to some recent legislative and judicial updates within the last year. I mean, there have been a ton of things that have come out in the last year, but we've tried to narrow it into the ones that we're seeing come up the most frequently that employers are dealing with that we want to make sure that you are aware of if you do business in California. So the first one that I wanted to point out is the passage of a bill that was known as AB 673. It was an amendment to Labor, Labor Code 210, and this one has kind of flown under the radar. So what this was is that Labor Code 210 Use, has always allowed for uh, um, employees to seek penalties for, or not employees, it has allowed for penalties for untimely or discriminatory wage payments. However, it used to just be enforceable by the labor commissioner. So there was no private right of action for employees to seek penalties um, related to either, so you, you're all aware of it in California, you can, well hopefully you're all aware, but in California if someone is terminated and they're not paid all of their wages, then they can get waiting time penalties. 
But what this new change to Section 210 does is it also allows them to get potentially penalties for untimely wages while they are current employees. Um, so if a paycheck is late, um, and it also allows for penalties if they have had discrimination in pay based on sex, race, or ethnicity, so having to do with the California Equal Pay Act. Um, where we are seeing this arise most frequently has to do with employers that pay uh, um, like commissions or incentive plans, and there is a significant lag between when the uh, commissions or incentive plans are earned and when they are paid out. So, um, for example, if an employee has met all of the qualifications for the earning the commission and the employer sort of agrees that that has happened, but the employer's payroll is on a three-week, four-week lag cycle to pay out commissions, we are seeing that come up as a potential claim now under Section 210. We have also seen, um, this is a little bit more creative because there's a seasoned debate about whether or not this is wages, of course, but where employers um, are failing to pay out sick pay in the period in which it is due, and there is occasionally lags in paying out sick pay for people, which presumably now is going to be more of an issue with COVID as well. So that's where we've been seeing these claims come up. So please keep that in mind, particularly if you have certain kinds of pay that are in, on a delayed pay cycle. Um, and the, the one sort of bright note, I guess, as it were, for California is that um, this has to, claims under 210 have to be, um, the employee has to choose whether to recover under Section 210 or under the Private Attorneys General Act, which is um, has a smaller penalty than the new revised 210. So under the new 210, the penalties for um, are $100 for the first violation and $200 for the subsequent violation and the employer has to pay 25% of the wages that were paid late or unfairly versus PAGA, um, which has larger penalties, but um, employees don't get to keep all of it. A portion of it, 75% of the penalties go to the state. So um, depending on the amounts, um, employees may sort of pick and choose which provision they want to use to enforce it, but the legislature had the uh, good naturedness to tell them that they cannot pursue both. Um, another thing that we've been seeing come up has to do, and that uh, was decided this year, are some issues with regular rates. So there has been a seasoned debate over the last couple of years as to whether um, it will, let me take a step back for those of you that are not familiar with California law, if an employee is not provided with a compliant meal, rest, or recovery period, they are entitled to one hour of pay um, as a penalty. So if, for example, someone has to work through a lunch or through a rest break, then they are entitled to a penalty wage. Um, there has been some season debate as to whether or not that had to be paid at an employee's regular rate, which could include commissions or bonuses and things of that nature, or if it needed to be paid at their base hourly rate. Well, this year there was a decision that came out that allowed for it to be paid, or that definitively said that it can be paid at the employee's base hourly rate, which is generally lower than a regular rate in the t traditional sense of that terminology. Now, conversely, um, sick pay leave in California does need to be paid at the regular rate, which is higher, <laughs> I'm sorry, I realize that I have a goofy typo on the side, often higher than the base rate. So um, here, in if somebody is getting paid out sick leave and they are a commissioned employee or they earn bonuses, they need to be paid at the rate in which they are either earning for that week their regular rate or the uh, average regular rate of the last 90 days. So this is not a particularly new provision. The difference here is that we are now starting to see litigation on it because since these um, sick pay provisions have been enacted, um, enough time has now passed that it's uh, worth it for plaintiff lawyers to go after this. So. While that's not a particularly new provision, we wanted to alert you all to it to let you know that it is on the radar. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Chantel to talk about a, another thing that we are seeing some litigation on recently. I remembered to do mute this time. I almost forgot. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be talking about a recent court case um, discussing unlimited vacation plans. Um, you know. Perhaps some of you on this call uh, 
have experience with these. These are increasingly popular um, as a means to attract talent, provide flexibility for employees. Um, and a, uh, the Court of Appeal, for the first time on the appellate level, addressed the, the, the use of an unlimited vacation plan um, in April of 2020 and provided some clarity regarding the specific facts of that case. What is notable is that the, the court in ruling that, a, um, that the EF Intercultural Foundation um, did, uh, uh, had, a, had a policy that was um, in violation of the law, made it very clear that unlimited vacation policies are not de facto illegal. Um, rather, focusing on the facts of that case, um, the the uh, the court provided some guidance on what it is that an unlimited policy should look like going forward. And the takeaways from this is that we have to remember that here in California, and this is not a new law, is that we do not, you cannot have a use it or lose it vacation policy. While there is zero requirement that you offer vacation at all, if you do offer vacation, it doesn't evaporate. Um, and that Additionally, when employees are terminated, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, um, they need to be paid out any accrued vacation. Um, and this case, in many ways, is very timely because we're seeing a lot of uh, furloughs and layoffs in, in light of COVID-19 and the economic strain that it has put on employers. And so taking a close look at um, whether you have risk here is really important in light of this case. Um, what was unique about this case and the and the um the court of appeal really focused on these facts here is that there was no written policy explaining that the um impacted employees even had an unlimited plan um and that lack of policy is one of the facts that carried the day um and were made it so that the employees were successful in arguing that they in reality did have a vacation plan and that they were accruing vacation and that should have been paid out. Um, and so the court identified some features that um, for those um, employers that are, that want to have an unlimited vacation plan and offer that flexibility, that any, that number one, the plan needs to be written and needs to be clearly conveyed to the employees. Additionally, the plan itself, the policy, should really feature that the, you know, the PTA, PTO is not an additional wage, but it's a, it's, a plan, it's a form of flexible work scheduling. It really means that, you know, if you don't want to work on a, on a Monday, um, you know, you don't have to. But it is permissible, of course, to have guardrails um, um, in regards to when employees can take time off. Um, there needs to be also descriptions for the consequences. So if you fail to schedule the time off, um, you know, what happens? Um, likewise, um, you know, allowing um, the employees to the opportunity to take the time off as well as having or in the alternative work less hours so that they can they can actually use this policy. Um, and more importantly, uh, I think really the, the touchstone here needs to be that is this a de facto use it or lose it policy. Um, and if your policy has any indication that, um, or lack thereof, that an employee is actually accruing vacation, um, but then loses it upon termination because of the, it's been characterized as an unlimited vacation policy, there may be potential risks there that you need to evaluate. Um, unlimited vacation um, plans to the extent that it is um, something that as an employer you're interested in, these are uniquely well-suited for um, uh, positions where you have a very uh, a set deliverable. So for example, and as a law firm, um, you, know, you may have a certain billable hour requirement and it doesn't matter how many you know, days it takes you to get there, as long as you hit that billable requirement um, and you're meeting job expectations, then, then applying an unlimited policy may make more sense there than in other types of roles without those concrete deliverables. So with that, I'll pass it back to Kobe. Thank you, everyone. Um, so there has been a few additional legislative or judicial updates that um, are both, I, as you can see, I said the court giveth and the court taketh away. So 
um, there have been a few bright spots. The first one of which is that the court rejected plaintiff's attempts to use PAGA claims to collect unpaid wages. So for those of you that are not familiar with PAGA, it's the California Private Attorneys General Act, and it is essentially a de facto way to bring a class action without having to meet any class action requirements. So someone can bring a claim on behalf of all of the allegedly aggrieved employees, but not have to show that they're, for example, similarly situated. So it is, uh, and PAGA claims, most notably, are not subject to arbitration in California. So bringing claims via PAGA is a sort of end run around California's class action requirements, and it also um, is, uh, it allows them to seek um, pretty staunch penalties. So, but under PAGA, they are allowed to recover only penalties, and this case made that very clear because before that, uh, plaintiffs would often try to recover both the penalties allowable under PAGA as well as whatever the statute itself allowed for. So, um, in this particular case, the plaintiffs were suing for unpaid wages under Labor Code Section 558, um, where they claim that they worked off the clock and things of that nature. But this case determined definitively that they cannot seek those unpaid wages. They can only recover the civil penalties. So that was a win for employers. Another one that came out this year was there had been a series of plaintiffs that were suing employee, employer payroll companies. Um, I'm sure many of you use a third-party service to administer your payroll. And plaintiffs were suing and claiming that the uh, payroll companies were in some way vicariously liable for alleged labor code violations such as unpaid overtime or more frequently missed meal and rest period violations and or things to do with um, errors on wage statements because payroll companies generally uh, push out the wage statements. Um, in, in the case that came out earlier this year, the um, court definitively determined that the employee was not like a third party beneficiary of the contract between the employer and the payroll company. And so um, it essentially dismissed the payroll company from the case. And basically the court acknowledged that expanding liability in this sort of case would impose tons of litigation defense costs that are inconsistent with the expenses of both the employer and the payroll companies. Um, there, now, conversely, <laughs> there were a couple of other decisions that were uh, pretty nasty for employers here in California, um, one of which uh, has to do with employers who require employees to call in and see if they have to report to work that day. You most often see this in retail environments, but you also see it in, for example, restaurant environments, and um, I have a number of other companies that I work with that have um, jobs where the employee's uh, necessity of working depends on some other third party element, for example, like a truck arriving with supplies, and then if they know that's gonna happen, then they call people into work. So employees have to call in to see if they actually need to work that day. Now, historically, um, employers have not had to pay where employees call in and are told they don't need to pay. However, in this recent decision earlier this year, the court reversed its course on what was common understanding before and issued a very lengthy decision saying that if employees are required to call in to work, that they are due reporting time pay, even if they don't end up actually having to come in to work. And there have been subsequent decisions coming out of the Ninth Circuit that say that not only are they entitled to reporting time pay, but they are also entitled to time spent on the call and potentially cell phone reimbursements if they're forced to call from home. Now, the logic of this decision basically had to do with the fact that if someone may have to report th to work, they essentially can't aren't free to live their lives. They can't go out bar hopping. They may have to secure child care or care for adult parents. They have to plan their lives around this shift that they may not end up having to work unless they are due the reporting time pay. Um, another pretty nasty decision for employers here in California this year um, was a big wage statement case. Now, some of you may have heard of this case. Um, it was the Magadia decision, and it had to do with a very generous employer that paid its non-exempt employees uh, bonuses. The bonuses were pretty small, and they affected the regular rate um, in a very small manner. I mean, for most people, we're talking about less than a couple of dollars. Um, and when and the employer then trued up the overtime rate for the period of the bonus and went back and increased the overtime for the respective periods related to the bonus. Now what the employer did not do is when it reissued um, 
these retroactive pay um, related to the bonus, it did not specify the rate of pay and hours worked with respect to the bonus in every pay period for which it issued corrections. Now, there's no dispute that the employer paid all of the wages and even the back overtime correctly. The only issue was the hyper-technical violation on the wage statement. And nonetheless, the court found that to be a violation and saddled the employer with nearly a $50 million judgment in, uh, of PAGA penalties. And that was a reduction, which the court thought was generous, from over $130 million in penalties, which the court said it could have imposed. And the generous reduction had to do with the fact that the court acknowledged that the employer did not, in fact, even have to pay the bonuses and thus should not be so staunchly punished to be um, penalized with over $130 million in penalties. But the moral of the story here <laughs> is if you are, in fact, changing the pay related to back overtime, if you're issuing, uh, if you've had bonuses or commissions and things of that nature and you have to change back overtime wages, make sure on your wage statements that you are reissuing corrections that state both the hours that were associated with the bonus and the adjusted rate because it is a staunch penalty for a no good deed goes unpunished kind of scenario. And on that happy note, I am going to turn it back over to my colleague, Emery. Thank you very much, Kobe. So um, in our closing moments, we just wanted to um, highlight for you how you can get a copy of um, our uh, 2020 uh, Cal Peculiarities book. Um, you can um, request either an ebook um, or download a PDF um, to obtain the book. Um, we also would urge you to subscribe to our Cal Peculiarities blog that Kobe mentioned at the outset of today's presentation. Um, what I think distinguishes our blog, I know there, there are lots of blogs out there, is that we um, don't really focus on uh, so much um, a discussion, a, a detailed discussion of the law, but instead um, aim to provide pragmatic, practical guidance in terms of what you should do in response to the development, whether it be a statute or um, a new case that's come down. So, you know, we of course will explain the case or the statute briefly, but then a substantial portion of the blog is devoted to explaining, okay, well, what does this mean for all intents and purposes, and what am I supposed to do, if anything, in response to this development? Um, we also urge you, if you haven't signed up already, to sign up for our California Labor and Employment mailing list, so you receive um, invitations to uh, webinars, such as this webinar, um, as well as management alerts and um, other material regarding California development. And then um, finally here, we've highlighted uh, COVID-19 resources um, because as we said, we know um, while well, California peculiarities um, continue to um, be a burden, um, uh, you are also dealing with the pandemic and probably 80 to 90% of your time right now, I would guess, um, if you're like me, is spent um, on uh, COVID-19 issues. So um, on this slide, there is the address to our COVID-19 Resource Center, um, as well as um, the address to sign up for our updates. Um, and uh, we've also included a link to our webinars on demand. So we have had, gosh, um, I, I don't know the exact number, but numerous uh, COVID-19 webinars. Um, we've covered, for example, return to work. We've covered um, health screening and testing was one webinar. Um, I know we've had a webinar on the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I, I would be surprised if we've had less than a dozen. And so they are available um, on that link, the last uh, bullet point on your slide. Uh, includes the link to um, to access those webinars at your convenience. 
And um, with that, I just want to thank you all for coming uh, to our webinar, and that concludes today's presentation. We hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.